Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to the Minnesota Learning Commons webinar series. My name is Mary Messacomer. I'm the current administrator for the Minnesota Learning Commons, which is a partnership between the Minnesota Department of Education, Minnesota State, and the University of Minnesota. And we are dedicated to discussing and networking and creating solutions around all aspects of things related to digital learning and online learning. Um, so today I am so excited to bring you um, this burgeoning topic of generative IT and chat GPT and implications for education. And we have some wonderful panelists who have agreed to join us today. And these folks are considered early adopters, if you will, um, none of us are experts in this um, new world of AI and uh, ChatGPT as yet, but these are folks that have been working with it and have a lot of things that they can share with us today. So welcome. Um, and we do have the chat, I'm sorry, not the chat, but the Q&A feature enabled on the webinar. And so you will be able to submit questions to the panelists during the course of the webinar. And of course, we'll be asking them some questions to address. So with that, I'm going to ask our panelists to introduce themselves very briefly. And I'm going to start with David Berner from Southwest West Central Service Block. Hi, everybody. Uh, like Mary said, David Berner, Southwest West Central Service Cooperative. Uh, we work with the that entire region um, in a variety of different areas, but uh, for my purposes, uh, I, I help uh, run the tech integration team, and so I'm the program coordinator currently for our team of four that we have right now, um, and we currently service uh, eight schools as well as six ELC sites. Great. Thank you, David. Kathleen, I'll go to you next. Hi, I'm Kathleen Cote, and I have about 24 years of teaching experience in higher ed um, between Iowa and Minnesota in the fields of communications and theater. Um, my last couple of years, I have been dedicated solely to instructional design. So I've had a couple of classes here and there. Um, I don't currently have a class of students, but I serve Normandale Community College as an instructional designer and technologist. Thank you, Kathleen. Kyle from Minitex, I'll go to you next. Hi, everybody. Kyle from Fibu, uh, work at Minitex. If you don't know Minitex, I'd be surprised, but we have our hands in a lot of things. Um, MinLink, you know, Elm, just tons of stuff across the board for all of Minnesota. Um, my job there, I involve, I work with MinLink, I handle electronic delivery. I'm also the liaison from our resource sharing department to our IT department. So I handle our software um, that the IT people make and get fixes and updates and patches like that. That's pretty much me. Thank you, Kyle. Would it be safe to describe Minitex as our state library agency out of the University of Minnesota? Correct, yes. We are also the lending arm of the University of Minnesota as well. And we are housed okay. there. Great, thank you. Um, I'm going to go to Alexis next. Hi, I'm Alexis Elder. I am an associate professor of philosophy at the University of Minnesota Duluth, specializing in technology ethics. Uh, and uh, I've been involved in a number of conversations at the Duluth campus about responding to different issues with uh, generative AI and uh, played with it a bit in some of my classes as well. Actually, more some of the um, art programs than ChatGPT so far, just um, sort of accident of what I was teaching and what students were interested in. Um, but yeah, it, really interested in how this is evolving. Okay, thank you, Alexis. And John, Fila. Hi, I work at Intermediate District 287, uh, which runs uh, the Northern Star Online program. It's an asynchronous supplemental uh, high school program. I've trained teachers from around the state to use ed tech tools to create curriculum and, and OER in all kinds of subject areas. And I, I work on various issues of equity and accessibility in our district. And I was a 2022 Minnesota Teacher of the Year finalist. 
Congratulations, John, and thanks for being here. And Stephen Kelly is our host from Minnesota State. Stephen, would you like to introduce yourself? Certainly. Uh, thank you, Mary. My name is Stephen Kelly. I currently serve as the Innovation Program Director at the Minnesota State System Office, and I also have the privilege to serve currently as the chair for the Minnesota Learning Commons. And I'm just so happy to be here and have this opportunity to listen to all these great panelists today. Thanks so much. Okay, thank you. Well, I think we'll get started with the first question. And in order to make good use of our time and avoid awkward silence, I will probably tell you the question and then I will call on one of you um, to, to give us a response. And we'll kind of proceed that way throughout the course of the webinar. So the first question um, is, in what ways have you interacted with chat GPT or other forms of generative AI? Um, if you would please share some of your experiences with our audience, especially those that might include students, but if you have other experiences not including students, that's perfectly okay too. Um, and so I think for this one, I am going to start with John Fila, if you don't mind. Sure. Um, so I get new examples with students on this every day. Uh, I've been playing around with some of the AI image generators for a while. And as soon as ChatGPT um, and other tools have been available, I, I first like to just screw around with them and have fun with my friends because that's where I feel like I kind of get a sense for the, the different types of uses that there may be. But I see about five student submissions using ChatGPT on a daily basis. Uh, I've got about 185 asynchronous uh, students in my English courses right now. So it's becoming more and more a part of my day and, and what I uh, end up immersing myself in. I mean, some of the more amusing submissions I've seen are the ones where students don't bother to even read what it cranks out. They just blindly submit it. So the AI, um, since I'm usually asking them personal questions, the AI will refer to itself as a machine or as AI. So those are the fun ones to spot and use as examples. Um, but in my courses, there are a lot of questions that don't lend themselves well to those kinds of AI generated responses about cultural identity or personal experience and opinions. So I originally wrote the courses that way to avoid the temptation for them to Google responses, but I'm finding that those kinds of questions are also working well for spotting AI responses. That's great. Thank you, John. Um, Kathleen, do you mind if I turn to you next? Sure. Um, I've been primarily playing around with chat GPT recently. Um, and I, like I said, I don't currently have a group of students, but I went back to some of my most recent classes and grabbed some of the text. And I'm primarily looking right now at discussion boards in asynchronous classes, because I do have a lot of prompts that are very informal, but formative assessments and or building blocks for um, scaffolded projects that they're working on. So in, for example, in my television class, they have to um, pick a show, you know, talk about a particular show that they're watching. It has to be a fairly recent show. Um, and one of, and so I'll take some of those prompts that I've used in the past and I'll put them into chat GPT and just see. And I'm pretty amazed at how sophisticated sometimes the answers can be. Sometimes I'll think, oh, this will stump it. And nope, <laughs> not really. Um, it's pulling, it's, it's not, you know, it's, it's not very in depth. And so what I would say off the top, what I'm seeing is the breadth and the depth of the responses is very shallow, very short and very shallow. And so I think I'm seeing a lot of heads nodding. Mm -hmm. um, so that's where I would dig in farther and I would prompt the students then to, sure, if you wanna put this prompt into ChatBG, GPT, go ahead, but you're going to have to finish it. You know, you're going to have to actually use it to come up with something of your own. And so that's what I've been doing the most with. Um, I've also played around a little bit with chat G, uh, G, GPT-0, gpt0.me. I don't know if anybody's tried that, but I took some of the generated products and I put them into that. And it's pretty accurate right now anyway, um, where it will tell me, yes, this was written entirely by AI, or sometimes it'll say partially, even if it was all. 
Um, I'm also taking some of my own papers that I wrote in grad school and putting in snippets of it into it. And it will say this was entirely written by a human. So that makes me feel better. Mm -hmm. um, so that's another thing I've been experimenting with a lot. And the third thing I've experimented with is how Turnitin works with this. Um, mm -hmm. I know that a lot of people ask me about that. And I know Turnitin is supposedly working on this, but um, it's not catching anything. It's, it's you know, 1% or maybe 5%, even if it's entirely AI. So that's something I've been just trying to see what happens when I work with those tools. So that's the gist of what I've been doing. Very interesting, Kathleen. Thank you. I will confess I did a kind of silly thing. I entered in um, who was buried in Grant's tomb, and I got a really, really off the wall kind of interesting rambling answer on that question. So, so I realized, okay, it maybe isn't going to answer everything correctly or completely. So thank you. Um, Kyle, I think I'll ask you next if you talk about your experience. Sure. Uh, I started with uh, Stable Diffusion, which was one of the kind of premier image synthesis tools that came out. Um, it's at the time, it was very sophisticated. It's kind of already showing its age. Um, and if people aren't aware, Stable Diffusion is an AI image synthesis model that you can run on your own machine. You don't go to a website and run it. You have to have a high-end graphics card because it uses your graphics card to generate the images. You can set tons of settings. You can set styles and stuff. And I pretty much just used it for mock-ups in my own personal use. And that kind of got me on board with using the tools. Um, the main thing I've used ChatGPT for is probably a little different than most people here. Uh, I used it to write a program for me. Um, mm -hmm. I know a fair amount of code and how it works, but I've never written a full program before, mostly just scripts. And so I had it write, help me write a program that's actually pretty sophisticated that um, it takes an article title or ISSN, and then it uses the University of Minnesota's catalog or discovery layer, whatever you want to call it, um, finds the first result, checks to make sure it's a match. Um, if it's a match, it then goes into our ILS, our integrated library system, and goes into our acquisitions module and finds the licensing terms for interlibrary loan. And so it right. matches one-to-one -one the article that you, we have access to through our databases to the licensing terms. Um, stuff that you know a normal programmer could easily do, but I had zero idea. Um, it was written in Python and um, everything worked. And it even told me things like on how do you check for errors and um, it worked perfectly fine. And it was great. And so students might not be directly using it, but eventually this was just a proof of concept at first, but it will be integrated into our work. And so any article that comes through our office is eventually going to be run through this to check for a license. So it's going to increase our work or decrease our work technically by quite a bit. And that's pretty much mostly what I've used for is just code um, that and other snippets of code and scripts that I've come up with over time. And it's great for code. Amazing. And I bet saves you tons of time too. Yep. Oh, okay. Thank you, Kyle. David, certainly not last but not least, I'll come to you. Yeah. Um, so ours our approach is a little bit uh a little bit different. Um, we're looking at a lot of stuff as an organization, uh, just in terms of uh what's out there. Mainly, uh, we're working on a course to teach teachers about AI, um, and I can talk a little bit more about that maybe later, but uh, just in terms of the interactions with some of the tools that are out there, uh, we we look, we're, when we've look been really looking at more of the conversational types uh, of AI like ChatGPT, where you can put in your prompts and get responses and um, and that's been really interesting, but we've also been looking at um, some of the text to image stuff um, like deep AI or um, open AI has uh, Dolly, uh, it's D-A-L-L, -L, like a hyphen E. Um, and then um, one other really interesting one that we've come across as we've kind of been looking through uh, some of the different variations that have been out there, um, there are things like DreamX, which is um, the ability to take video and input it into AI and the AI will recreate the scene of what it 
what it was essentially watching or the the data from that that video and recreate it there's a really cool one of a dog that's playing with a ball kind of like a german shepherd uh, dog that's playing with a ball and the ai recreates that same scene so um, we've really been just trying to dig into a lot of that stuff and look at all of what's available but at the same time uh temper our our um what we want to do at first here because we do want to focus on getting teachers knowledge about um, some of the things like chat gpt and maybe the ones that are a little bit more pressing so that's kind of what we've been doing great so anything else that you any of you would like to comment on on that first question sure um so i had a couple of stories um that sprang to mind for me um first was last semester just as uh, mid journey and some of the other um, art generators were coming online i was teaching a class on values and technology and the students asked some questions so i sort of threw together a, a unit at the last minute um where we were it, it sort of fit in between some conversations we were having about the indiscriminate pattern matching that occurs with a lot of uh, machine learning systems and so I sort of loaded up the system and we did a live demo of my journey in class and I asked it to generate an, a picture of an orange hamster and it took orange literally. Um, so it literally drew an orange with a hamster face, which was just a beautiful like accidental learning moment about like the texture of the orange was gorgeous, but it clearly did not get from context what sense of orange was involved. <laughs> um, so that was fantastic. Uh, and it, it paired nicely with some conversations we were having about intellectual property and um, the extent to which um, coding and artistic communities are sort of drawing from community resource, resources um, versus sort of putting their own spin on things. And we had this conversation about whether these are more like cameras, like tools for us to express our creativity um, versus sort of humanoid stand-ins stand doing their own work. Um, so I found that a really kind of like productive contribution to the conversation, but that also highlighted some of the the perils of that uh, inability to determine context and just sort of like reaching for the handiest correlation. Uh, and then this semester, the local um, students, we call them the Socratic Society, the um, philosophy students asked me to come in and talk about ChatGPT just as that was breaking. Uh, and they have, a, a lot of the conversation was about what does communication do? Like, is it about um, reinforcing connections between people uh, or like getting feedback on your own work? Uh, there, right? People who voluntarily voluntarily uh, major in philosophy are already disproportionately likely to like reading and talking about things. <laughs> so I'm not so worried about them, you know, using it to, to cheat assignments, uh, but they recognize that that was a, a peril. But we were talking about like uncertainty about who's saying stuff and then right before we logged on i was chatting with them uh, and we came across a headline from the guardian that they made me promise to share with you all uh it's from the uh the guardian today has a headline about uh vanderbilt uh issuing an apology for using chat gpt in a consoling email on the michigan shooting uh so oh apparently gosh. they sent out a like we're so sorry our sympathies like uh, but it was written by ChatGPT and the student community did not respond well. So they wanted me to bring that up for you all. And now I have. That is a good one, Alexis. Thank you. And I apologize. I meant to call on you. I must be a very nervous facilitator. I just am trying to make sure everyone gets heard. Um, <clears throat> so thank you for those, um, for those stories. So, um, if we're good, I'm going to go ahead and move on to question two. Um, as we indicated before, you are all what we would consider early adopters of this uh, technology in your own right. A lot of you have mentioned that you've experimented and done some things on your own. So I feel confident asking you this question. What excites you most about the intersection of generative AI and education? And what dismays you the most? Um, and so, Alexis, I will flip right back to you and start with you because you kind of started to touch on that. Sure. Um, so I think one of the things I'm most excited about, um, and I'm I'm getting this from my colleague, uh, Joel and Rock in digital art, is if we think of these as ways to interface with kind of our cultural capital, right? So what's characteristic of these generative AI systems is they're trained on huge data sets 
like, you know, all the written content on the internet functionally, uh, or, you know, large subsections of it are like tons of um, previous artworks. If we ask it to produce content, we get a little snapshot of like, what are some of the patterns we didn't think about? So it's a way for us to kind of like interrogate um, biases and trends and see what what patterns it's sort of matching up, like it's not reflective, um, but we can use it as a way to get clearer on like the, the same kinds of things that we're steeped in, um, but make it explicit. So that to me is a really kind of promising way to give students some, um, some training in algorithmic literacy, really, right? Like what are these systems doing um, when they interact with data, not in a way that presupposes human-like understanding um, or the ability to kind of like stand in for human to human communication, but like to let us interface with the same data sets that are making decisions about us and that we're going to be, you know, interacting with in our lives. So I think that's, for me, the big promise is this kind of like data equ equity um, portal. Uh, and then in terms of concern, for me, the big one um, is trust. And I think we don't need to see a high rate of um, cheating or deception for people to start being more skeptical of each other's content. Like the way I've been thinking of it is, you know, it's rude to say to somebody like, prove that you're not a robot. Uh, and if this increases that level of distrust in our classrooms and in our communities, if students aren't sure whether like sympathetic emails from admin are authored by the, the, the people who care, like that can have a really detrimental effect on just the social fabric. So that's that's my big worry. Very good. Very well said. I think you um, captured that that idea so well. Um, John, I think I will go to you next. What excites you and what dismays you about this technology with education? Yeah. Um, so I often talk to teachers about providing quick and effective feedback, but it's it's really difficult to do for all of your learners all the time. And, you know, when I've right now, for instance, 185 students that I'm trying to do that with. Um, but if I can have them, you know, use utilize that tool first, they can get kind of a surface first layer of feedback before they even bring something to my attention. So, um, you know, it can be used as an assistant by students before they even give it to me. They can enter their text uh, of their response and ask it a question like, how can I make the following essay sound better? And then it will provide suggestions for them, you know, in ways that things like Grammarly and Hemingway app might not. Um, they can get an initial drafts of assignments that they can review um, just for an example. So that instead of asking me for a sample essay, they could just ask that to generate one for them and then decide what they like and don't like about it. Uh, as far as what dismays me, uh, I have some enormous concerns when it comes to issues of inequities relating to access and use. So if a district is blocking it, it's not blocked for everyone, is it? Um, some students have access to their own devices, off district networks. They're going, you know, they're going to find a way. And, and, you know, I certainly think a lot of the students that I work with have it blocked on their school devices and networks, but they're still finding ways to use it. Um, we have to be mindful of you know, the implicit biases of the uh, written into the code of the tool. So what guardrails are in place to ensure marginalized populations and perspectives are not being left out, you know, because we already experienced those things with facial recognition and even automated hand washing stations. So if we can't control um, any of that or the programmers of these tools, we have to be more proactive about teaching students how inequities are so often embedded in the code itself so we have to search it out we have to help students navigate to these credible sources of information so you know i do think it helps us build our relationships with students even more if we're if we have this other tool to kind of um, push our um lessons off onto in, in the same ways we're not really criticizing the students we can we can put our criticisms off onto this tool and use that an, as an example the same way we might use science fiction um, to criticize modern times right so we can use just use it as this um tool that isn't going to get offended but we can slam it all we want and hammer on it all we want and have some really important conversations Thank you, John. Uh, Kyle, I'll go to you next. Yeah, um, I think what 
I have to say about this might alarm people or maybe it's their source of dismay, but um, I'm hoping that we'll move away from papers. I hope we move towards more practical education as time goes on. Um, I'm not speaking as a direct educator myself, but as somebody mm -hmm. who went to college not that long ago, I just got, I studied film theory. Um, I never made a film. Um, there's just so many prohibited expenses to making a film. Um, I feel like I would have got a lot more of my education if, say, we had an AI that could make a film and you have to feed it, you know, things from a director you're studying or a genre you're studying and then talk about how we made that and how it's presented. Um, I just never got anything about how to papers or writing them besides grammar and how to mm -hmm. write them. Um, so I think that's exciting to me is the way you can maybe create things you couldn't create before in an educational setting. Um, that just sounds great to me. Um, in the dismay is maybe uh, a little detached from education in a way, but it kind of erased a barrier of work that I did. Like as I talked about before, I wrote scripts previously that a lot of people at my job use things that manipulate PDFs, other things. Um, after I used ChatGPT to write my Python program, I went back to it and fed a simple sentence, one of the scripts I created, did it instantly, one box, and that was it, and it was done. So technically any of my job, anybody at my job could have made that script then using that. Mm -hmm. So kind of have to up my own game to, <laughs> to, to get ahead of it. Mm -hmm. Absolutely, Kyle, thank you. Um, David, I will go to you next. Yeah, um, what I'm most excited about, um, touching on a little bit of what John said, um, is the ability for students and teachers to use this in unique ways. And I think that part of this, um, what's interesting is that with it just getting introduced and everybody becoming more and more aware of it, we haven't really even seen um, some of the fun things or unique things that teachers can do with it when they utilize it in the classroom. Um, and so, and John gave the example of, you know, more so on the teacher side, giving the, freeing up the teacher in a way that, you know, the student can actually look for feedback from chat GPT. If they, if they wrote a rough draft of a paper, they can input it in there and get feedback cues you know, on what are what are some ways you can improve your paper and that frees up the teacher to do other things. But I think um, probably the more important piece of it is that it with with the way that teachers and students could both interact with chat GBT and the way that they do assignments, it could really create more of an active atmosphere of assessing students rather than passive. You know, we're just saying, um, here's a here, go write this paper and turn it in when you're done. You know, it's more write the paper, have chat GPT evaluate your paper, then rewrite your paper, and then let's talk about what you learned from your paper, those type of things. Um, and that's that's really what we try to focus on a lot, is kind of more like the glass half full things. I know that there's a lot of uh negative things going on around as well. Um, and so we, we're trying to look a lot at that in some of the, the unique ways that it can be used in the classroom. And that's, that's what I'm probably most excited about, um, is continuing to explore that. Um, and then I would say on the side for dismayed, I think it is just that I think it's, uh, trying to get out in front of some of the, um, maybe the misinformation or the the negative thoughts around something like this i think that there's definitely concerns that are warranted um and i i just hope that we can have an opportunity to uh walk teachers through how to use it effectively um and not necessarily uh jump right to worrying about um what this what are all the the downsides um but more focusing on what are some ways that we can use it uh to its fullest, so. Yeah, so I think that's a really big point, David. A lot of the media and, um, reports and things that I read just in the beginning were all about, oh my gosh, students are gonna be cheating all over the place and how do we shut this down? And I'm just so encouraged by hearing um, these really creative 
educators in the audience um, today uh, with you at the panel um, talking about that ability to be creative with it and to use it for student learning. I think that's really important. But yes. Kathleen. Oh, sorry, David, I didn't mean to cut you off. No, I was just going to say, if you if you Google chat GPT banned, it's kind of funny because you'll get a lot of news articles that say, you know, this state banned it and this school banned it and stuff like that. And um, I think that's not the best way to look at it um, always. So it's in kind K of in K-12 anyway, that's where my background is. It is always possible for a student to figure their way around something that's banned. And I'm never sure if we should applaud their innovation or um, be mad at them, but they do find their ways around it. So as far as I'm concerned, empowering them to use these tools for good is where we want to go. So thank you for that. Kathleen, I'm sorry, back to you. Yeah, and to just piggyback on, on what Kyle was saying and what you've just been saying about trying to ban it or prevent students from using it, it is going to be in the workforce. Um, we're supposed to be preparing students for the workforce. So banning it is pretty, pretty irresponsible, I think. Um, so I actually thought about this question about what excites me and what dismays me. I, a couple of days ago on NPR on the hidden brain, I don't know if anybody mm -hmm. caught that, they were talking about purpose, power of purpose. And one thing that struck me was um, they did a study where they gave people a chance to write down their goals and then they asked them to climb a mountain and then they asked them to write down their purpose and then they asked them to climb a mountain again. And the ones who wrote their purpose were much more effective at climbing the mountain and much more energetic and they they just did better. So, and I'm, I'm very much butchering that as I try to summarize that Hidden Brain episode, but if you want to catch it, um, it was really interesting. And so, you know, we tend to think of goals in education, your classroom, your learning goals and your module goals and your learning outcomes and your learning objectives. We talk about that a lot, but we don't really talk about purpose. What, you know, what, what really is the point of education? And I think this tool, I'm encouraged by the fact that it's challenging us to answer that question for good. <laughs> like, let's just answer this question. What is our purpose as human beings now in this world where anything can be generated? Um, and so I think that is something that we can re-examine and I'm excited about that re-examination. Re the purpose of assessments, the purpose of a class in general, the purpose of learning and getting to know our students and knowing um, and, and taking the fear away from education so that they're not afraid because we all know that students tend to cheat more when they're, mm -hmm. when they are afraid of failing. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. um, so taking a good hard long look at our assessments and what, what their purpose is, is one thing I'm excited about re-examining the scaffolding and the project-based learning and the constructivist learning theories. Um, the thing that dismays me is kind of similar, though, um, like Kyle was saying, losing our sense of self in all of this. I think stu mm -hmm. if we are feeling dismayed, students certainly are. What's the point of me trying to learn how to write a paper if I can just have chat BT? I mean, we all experienced this in the 90s and early 2000s when the Internet hit, um, became popular, and we'd spent all those hours in the library basement and the microfiche. And it takes five seconds to find the same thing mm -hmm. nowadays. And so this is just another reinvention of that. And we got through it. We survived. But um, where, you know, we had to we had to do a lot of reexamination. Um, so I'm afraid that students might start to lose their sense of self and their sense of value for education in general. So I. I would encourage us to get ahead of that as fast as we can. And then the last thing that dismays me a little bit is I'm just afraid. I just, I'm afraid of big tech in general and how they steamroll. Um, you know, Congress still doesn't know what Facebook is. So how are we going to have meaningful legislation and regulation of these tools that protects people? So that's one thing I'm a little nervous about. Very, very true. Thank you, Kathleen. Okay, I'm gonna move to our next question. Um, Wayne Gretzky, you've probably all heard this one before. 
has a famous saying that he always skated to where the hockey puck was going, not where it had been. So he was trying to predict where that puck was going to be on the ice and get to it. Um, Chat GPT and generative AI is here. Um, and so, and we all have probably experienced in some way, some level, um, some of the previous iterations of it. Um, but in your opinion, what do educators need to be paying very close attention to moving forward? And some of you have touched on this a little bit. So um, in terms of how do we stay ahead of the puck, as it were, um, if we're thinking about this with that Wayne Gretzky analogy. And I think for this one, I will start with Kyle this time. Um, I took a while to think about this and I don't know if I have a really good answer besides that we just need to keep educating ourselves. Um, I'm, I consider myself uh, pretty technically savvy, but I also make sure I'm reading Arch Technica every day. There are really great write-ups about AI every day on there. There's this really great YouTube channel that doesn't get that many views, but it's called Two Minute Papers. They're usually very short videos and they're all about emerging AI. They can be very scary sometimes, but I think it's better to be aware of them. Um, like this is just moving at such a like, crazy speed. As I was saying, I used stable diffusion last year at the very end of the year. There are already miles of past image synthesis. There is video synthesis. There is voice synthesis. You can make full motion videos. I don't know if anybody watched um, Nothing Forever on Twitch. Uh, there's a basically re AI generated Seinfeld episodes, fully voiced with um, video graphics. And they fed them cycled scripts so they would make jokes in the structure. And they all these three things came together. And it didn't really make sense, but it's there and it was watchable. So just knowing like what's around the corner, what's even possible, I think is pretty important. And especially if there's new tools we can all use, get people excited about or students excited about anything, you know. I think that's really great. And I think we already have already mentioned this a ton. Each of us have mentioned it, um, the bias behind it. We have to make sure that we're always teaching that these things are bigger black holes than a website, than Wikipedia, than all this. We don't know the data sets behind them. Yeah. We don't know where any of the information that they have is coming from. They don't have to. So, um, you know, it's all based on human input and all human output is biased. So, we just have to keep thinking of that. Absolutely. Thank you, Kyle. Kathleen, I'll jump to you. Uh, I like that this is a sports analogy because I, I love sports analogies because they're so clear. <laughs> you know, you have <laughs> one goal to win the game. Um, and so keeping the eyes on the prize and hel helping students visualize the their purpose for being there in the first place, just like coaches help students visualize winning the game. Um, visualize yourself at the finish line with the score being the highest that it could be. Um, if we can help our students do the same thing, um, then I think, it, it, like I said before, defining the purpose of being there in the first place, and it isn't just about to get the grade. Um, for example, you know, in a in a science class, um, we need to cure cancer, you know, like that's a purpose mm -hmm. for being here. And so just keep those big picture analogies in students' lives, I think is really important. Thank you, Kathleen. You make me think of um, the Start With Why by um, Simon Sinek to, you know, trying to make sure that our that the assignments we're giving have some context and have some real world application and some meaning, I think is um, even more important now with the advent of these tools. Thank you for that. Um, David, I will call on you next. Uh, yeah, I think for us, um, you know, our concern is always getting the information out to the teachers that we serve um, because with all of our schools that we work with, um, you know, we're, we're kind of considered the, um, the fountain, I guess, of where that, that information is coming from. Um, and so 
with teachers always, I mean, they're, they're constantly busy and they're, they have a lot of things that they have to tend to. Um, so it's kind of, it's incumbent upon us as, you know, like my team, we're working uh, directly with our cybersecurity uh, department as well that we have at our organization and really just focusing on creating a course that can inform teachers uh, that, that we're trying to make available to our member districts. Um, and really it's just an effort to get teachers the information that they need in small bites um, and so that they could stay up to speed or aware of some of the things that are going on. And that I, part of that too is also trying to mitigate some of the negative or um, misinformation that's out there. Um, so for us, we're, we're just going to be constantly focused on how is the AI changing? How does that impact you in the school? what new things are being introduced and that's that's really what we're looking at um because we 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 have a responsibility to our schools just to keep them informed on uh what's going on and so that was the the impetus for creating a course in the first place was yeah. to be able to do that but obviously like with this question that is that is the big thing is us staying one step ahead of the, uh of the uh you know the puck or going to where it's where it's going to be arriving um, and needing it there so that we can uh, so that we can get that information to our teachers. Absolutely. And I think back to what Kathleen said earlier, which um, I just loved. She said, you know, when students are afraid, that's when they're inclined to um, to cheat or take shortcuts because they're afraid and they're just not sure where to go with things. I think the same holds true with instructors, too. You know, when they see something like this, and it's so incredibly overwhelming at first, um, the first, you know, the first notion you have is to like, oh, not even going to go there, you know, just don't even want to touch it. So I think um, we definitely, the fact that you're creating a course for teachers and helping them take this in bite-sized pieces is wonderful. So thank you, David. Um, Alexis, I will ask you what you're thinking here. Yeah, um, this has been really useful hearing just different perspectives, but I, I think I want to start with um, something Kathleen said a couple of questions ago about being suspicious of big tech, right? So I've been trying to keep track of the different analogies folks are drawing, saying it's like a calculator or it's like Wikipedia, um, and it seems to me it's different from both of those. Um, this is a PR move by a big company trying to sell a product not to end users, but to other big companies and to boost stock prices. Um, so I try to be really mindful in how I'm thinking and talking about this, not to do their PR work for them. I think there are exciting opportunities here, uh, but I think we need to be really clear about what its strengths and weaknesses and abilities are. Um, and I am very concerned that we keep track of the fact that it's just kind of like watching the questions scrolling through in the Q&A, lots of talk about hallucinations and dreaming. And I think Robin Sloan, who's an author who's done collaborative work with AI, says, like, we get the metaphor wrong when we think they're like the cold, calculating, accurate mm -hmm. um, systems. That's not what machine learning is good for. It is this kind of like dream state where it like brings up um, evocative images for us, but it is not to be trusted. Um, and thinking about how do we work with that well and responsibly, bearing in mind that our access and sort of the, the state of things is embedded in this particular economic context where education in general just seems to be collateral damage for a PR um, move to, you know, to put it bluntly. Um, so I think like, how do we teach that it's not a calculator? We know it gets basic math wrong. Um, it's not, even though computers can do math perfectly well, it's not even trying to connect to the resources that are available. How do we work with what it really is and in thinking about like, what do we want? I, I love the purpose question as well. Um, what are the costs of being defensive here? Like I'm very worried about folks trying to build chat GPT proof assignments that are designed to like catch out the students. Um, I think some of that can be useful if it, you know, prods us to be um, more creative, but I think it can also contribute to more student surveillance and more hostile classroom spaces. And thinking about like, where are we willing to say, you may cheat, but like, that's kind of your problem. And my job is to, to meet you with what you show up as, like, these are gonna be ongoing questions for us. So for me, those are the kind of big ones. How do we think individually and collectively about how to respond to this distinctive challenge coming out of a, um, a interaction between uh, economic entities that are not thinking about higher ed, except as kind of a PR management problem. 
and how do we thoughtfully engage with its real capacities and limitations? So those those are my kind of big picture concerns. Sorry, I may have gone a little philosopher there. No, you're you're marvelous and you're spot on. Thank you, Alexis. Um, John, I'll go to you last here. Sure. Um, just to piggyback on something Alexis just said and AI proof assignments. I mean, you can spend weeks doing that now. And we laugh about some of the responses, right? Like they're a toddler speaking back to us, but these things are getting exponentially better and we're teaching it every day. I mean, millions of people are feeding it more data and how to get better. So, you know, you can go ahead and waste your time trying to make it AI proof, but that might work for a few months, but it's not going to work next year. Right. Um, so in terms of staying ahead, you know, I think on some level we should require um, at least teachers to use it. Um, you know, if, if, if they're aware of the tool, uh, it's already being utilized in almost every field. So we're doing learners a disservice if we're not helping them prepare for a world where it's a regular feature of their days. Um, you know, I'm reminded of uh, there's a math and integrated reading writing tool called EdReady um, put out by NROC, and they um, they don't tell people how to use it. They let their members take the tool and then figure that out, what works best within the context of their organization for their learners. And I see this as very much the same thing um, where the, the tool is out there, right? So um, how does it, what does that mean for the learners in your environment? I think we have to accept the inevitability of it all. You know, we can be certain that our learners are going there to use it. That helps us create a plan um, while avoiding some kind of forced compliance into a zero tolerance policy, you know, those kinds of uh, desire paths are just turning students into rule breakers, right? So I think we have to assume it's going to improve exponentially very quickly. Um, you know, these toddlers grow up fast and we can use it for one-to-one -one feedback loops with learners. We can incorporate it into their responses. I know there was a question in the chat that we shouldn't compel students to get accounts. I, I agree with that, but we can, as teachers, show them how it's used. We can give them the AI response and critique that. Um, we can have it summarize and simplify text. We can have it write, and I've done this already, I've had it write quizzes and study guides for students on the readings in our courses. And then I, I do think the best way is to is start incorporating media literacy into every subject area, not leaving it to the domain of an English teacher as part of, you know, some standalone lessons. This is everyday stuff now. Yeah. You know, we say every teacher is a reading teacher. Every teacher is a writing teacher. OK, now every teacher is a media literacy teacher. I'll get off the soapbox now. No, you are you are so right with that, too, because. I think about all the um, things with AI and deep fakes and things that are going on um, in the media too. And it's so important that our students and in many cases, their parents um, build those media literacy skills so that they know uh, when they're looking at something that is authentic as opposed to maybe not completely so. So thank you for that, John. Um, I'm gonna... Um, wrap us quickly up a little bit here just because we have some great questions in the Q&A that I want you to have a chance to answer. So I'm going to not call on you for this one, but I'm going to just um, say, if do any of you have any compelling words of advice or comfort you would share with your colleagues who are on the webinar with us today? And I'll just leave that open to any of you that wants to jump in and give us an answer and John's waving his hand. So I will call on him. Thank you, John. I'll, I'll, I'll do it quickly and get out of everyone's hair here. So yeah. um, there's no point in being afraid. I mean, I think there's far more positives than negatives about having this kind of assistant at your disposal. The more I talk to teachers about the positive uses, um, I think, you know, there's some fear in the unknown. Right. So as long as we're talking and collaborating and figuring this out together, there's really like it's happening. So being afraid about it isn't going to do anybody any good. Um, and, and so the sooner we can strategize about how to use it, the better off we're going to be. I'm trying to put together some guidance for teachers and districts right now um, to incorporate it into their settings. But I would say for, for classroom teachers or online teachers, 
get writing samples early from your students to start to know um, you know how they sound make it as personal as possible you know unfortunately it takes me about five times as long to grade a longer written response now because i'm really having to focus on just the style of the speaking um, so it just takes longer we have to make that time up in other areas so we should use it to then help us time bank a little bit and then um, i'm doing more with assigning drafts of assignments so i can see the revision so maybe they'll pull, maybe they'll pull one out of an ai generated response first but as i see them iterate and and create drafts that's that means more to me than if they'd come up with it initially um so teachers could just post the ai version initially and then have students write their own drafts based on it and then we could have a conversation as a class about how all these different humans created these varied responses from a singular item so i'm excited about that kind of use and and using it to bring people together awesome thank you john um steven i think we will move to um some of the questions that are coming in to the q a if you are ready to start that we can um i think with these we'll just um share the question and again i'll leave it up to somebody who feels they have a really good answer um to respond and Mary, I just shared the first question in the chat with you. So I'm oh, not sure if you'd like you. to read it for the yep. audience for today. Let me find it first here. Okay. So what skills and competencies do you see students and learners needing to stay relevant in a future with increasing AI tools and automation? So skills and competencies for students that they might need to stay relevant in a future where we're gonna have this AI stuff all around us. Anybody wanna jump into that? The first thing I think of is fact checking, mm -hmm. for sure. I mean, just your basic, like where, if you can't rely on the AI, where do you go? So librarians, you know, they're your best friend always. Always. <laughs> I'll add to that critical thinking. Like I think the the fact that this these systems are very good at the sort of um, surface level, superficially uh, enticing, but like substance free material. Um, it might not be this. Is my my anxiety is that especially in an environment where that's not always appreciated, um, a lot of folks are going to get excited about. Oh, hey, we can like outsource journalism to Chat GPT, and we might realize in five years that that's a bad idea, but it might be a little late to walk back some of the damage. Um, that said, I think this is a good reason to lean into content mastery and writing um, as a means of thinking and not just as sort of demonstrating that you've, you know, generated enough content to tick a box. Um, mm -hmm. that, that to me is a big one. Great. Thank you, Alexis. Anybody else? Any thoughts on skills and competencies for students? And if not, that's completely fine. Okay, Stephen, next question. Of course, and the next question is placed into the chat once again. Thank you, Stephen. Hang on, they kind of come in um, and I have to find them, there we go. Um, so in the light of articles being published lately, such as in the New York Times, about the instability and negative experiences that testers of Microsoft public preview of GPT in its Bing search found, GPT hallucinationing, and um, having off-the-wall answers like, uh, the, like the one I got for Grant's tomb, um, are there any ethical or moral considerations that might come into play perhaps with young people interacting with this new technology. So moral and ethical implications, and I know we've touched on some of these um, in your answers to the previous questions we asked. Um, oh, sorry. Uh, just Go briefly, ahead, Kathleen, and then I'll call on John. Yep. Sure. Um, I, I mentioned earlier, student the the fear that I have is students will lose their sense of self. That's mm -hmm. a psychological impact, I think, of media in general. And so I think that's something to definitely, I don't have an answer on how to prevent it, 
but we absolutely need to stay ahead of that and make sure that students are finding themselves and where they matter. And again, purpose, I keep coming back to that, but where do they matter in the world of AI? Because it's easy to feel like you don't have any worth because AI can do it all. So I think that's a moral implication that we need to solve quickly. Agreed. John, so go ahead. I would just add for, you know, those things that, are, that aren't explicitly related to an assignment or, or even some that are or that relate to students' mental health. Um, you know, I can, I can type in, you know, I'm feeling hopeless, what should I do? I can type in all kinds of questions related to my mental state and it will give me um, answers. And so we don't want students to be doing that in isolation or even at our prompting. So I think we have to be really careful about how we are asking students to use it when they are kind of under our sphere of influence. And, and if we don't want them to be relying on this um, when they should be having those conversations with a trusted adult. Yes, yeah. That ties right back with what Kathleen was saying about that sense of self too, definitely. Uh, I'll, I'll add on to that with a, a more concrete concern. Um, I think we're already here. I think we're already having these issues with the current round of search technologies that, you know, uprank uh, results that people find popular uh, or people find appealing rather than ones that are accurate. Uh, and uh, even auto prompting has been like in the current uh, realm of search has been linked with some really noxious stuff. Um, I was in a, a workshop yesterday with some faculty where we were going through I'm sorry, this is a super dark example. Um, Dylan Roof's uh, manifesto where he he credits his radicalization to a Google search um, where he was sort of ham-fistedly looking for some statistics about race and crime. And that ends up funneling him directly to a whole bunch of um, white supremacist organizations. Uh, like, I think we're already there. Uh, I don't think this is gonna make it better. And I think the fact that we're watching this technology, as John was saying, like grow up and get more convincing um, is going to make it that much harder to sort out the answers we want to see and the answers that we find plausible from the ones that are true. Uh, but yeah, I, I think we're there. Um, and if folks are interested, there's some uh, great discussion of the, the roof case. Sophia Noble, um, who's done a lot of work on information literacy and uh, information technologies uh, and um, Mark Alfano has a paper called Technological Seduction and Self-Radicalization, where he gets into like construction of search engines and the feedback loops between uh, auto-constructed answers that are appealing and uh, auto-constructed questions that are appealing. And when we're sort of letting the technology supply both the question and the answer, we feel like we're reasoning, but it's it's just sort of following the 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 patterned path all the way down. And when there's already patterns that we're trying to get away from that makes them that much harder to break out of. Yeah, and, and I'm just, just gonna add quickly onto that. Like mm -hmm. educators only, your you can only go so far. Parents are another huge thing in this. Parents are probably gonna need to be educated. There needs to be parental controls, monitoring and usage, how long they're on the computer, all that thing. Like only, educators can only go so far themselves. Yeah. Okay, Stephen, I think we probably have time for maybe one more question. Certainly, team that right up. And I think this one actually is going to be very fitting to end our time here today. Great. There it is, okay. So what are some of the ways we can use ChatGPT as teachers to save ourselves time? What are the ways we can empower our students to use AI in ways that save time, but encourage critical thinking too? This is our new reality, so how do we use it to our advantage? And many of you have touched on some things um, during our discussion today, um, but I'm going to throw that one out there and see if um, anybody wants to respond. Um, I was. I can. I just want to touch on the. Uh, teachers saving themselves time. Um, John and I kind of talked about that a little bit earlier in the in the discussion about uh, you know having it evaluate student work, for example. Uh, but one of the other things too 
um, that's kind of fascinating if you look at it from the teacher side is if you type into chat GPT, if you ask it for a lesson plan, you can actually be really specific about um, give me a lesson plan uh, that is <clears throat> for life science meeting Minnesota State Standard 3.2.1 or something like that, right? You can do those things um, and it'll generate the outline uh, of a lesson plan for you based, you know, time increments and everything like that, um, which is really kind of fascinating just to look at and see what kind of lessons it generates for you. Um, one of the, I would say like the positive things about that is it, it can save you some time in, in that you you would be able to look for new ways to deliver a lesson. So, you know, if you've got a lesson that you've done the same way for the last five, 10 years, there is some potential there for it to generate new ideas of delivering some content um, that could be really interesting. Um, obviously, you know, it's kind of the same thing with the students, right? We don't want to use it as a way to fluff off or not do the work that, you know, we should do. Um, obviously, you still have to deliver that lesson and you still have to, you know, have enough knowledge about that topic to be able to guide your students through that. But just the the idea of looking through lessons that it might generate is kind of interesting and could be a time saver um, in, in some ways. So that's that's one example that I've got. Great. John. Could I just quickly throw in? So I, I've answered as many questions in the chat as I could type um, answers to that quickly. But I would I do want to add that I want to, uh, in addition to lesson planning, we could have it help us write better directions that are more supportive and caring um, and, and offering some of that kind of language by putting it into the prompt so that we're incorporating um, SEL on our side of things so that students are seeing, especially in online courses where they're not talking to their instructors on a daily basis, um, they're, they're seeing that kind of supportive language then reflected in the directions of what we're asking them to do. And I put some other ideas in the, in the um, written response there too. Wonderful. Thank you, John. Any other last thoughts from any of the other panelists? I'm, I'm really sure. looking for, um, oh, go ahead. Oh, I'm really go looking forward to, Kathleen um, Alexis. I'm looking forward to learning how to tell students to declare use of AI, I, because I've heard lots of different things. I have a suggestion for that, but I'm curious because we need a guide. We need to know how to tell students. It's not a reference. It's not an accountable source that can be held accountable. So how do we, so that's one thing I'm looking forward to. That's really a good idea. Alexis, go ahead. Yeah, to, to Kathleen's question, um, I just saw something and I was frantically digging through email and can't find it. Um, but I believe uh, Queensland University in Australia, the librarians have a reference uh, recommendation. They recommend treating it like personal correspondence. Um, in that it's untraceable, but you're you're crediting this isn't my idea. I got it from interaction. Um, so I would recommend looking. Uh, I think that might be enough to <laughs> to look up. Uh, but it, it, just the general idea seemed really um, interesting. And um, I also in, messed up uh, trying to answer a question in in the text. But I think Sarah had asked about um, using writing to build skills, even when it's sort of chat um, chat GPTable. Uh, and that's a concern my students have really strongly expressed, uh, is that they do not want assignments to be so um, sort of tailored that they lose the opportunity to, you know, screw up with teachers and have this kind of um, back and forth. So I think it's worth noting that that's something they kind of voluntarily um, picked up and, and ran with is, is, a, is this idea that they do consider part of what they're doing training and part of what's valuable. Um, like they're, they're, they're very clear, like this isn't every student um, and some are going to be trying to figure out how to game the system, but they were concerned that they not lose that opportunity um, as a way to develop their own chops and their own skills. So I think it was heartening to me, <laughs> but just kind of reminding ourselves, right, that um, students do value that and we might want to think about how to preserve it um, or even be willing to like take the hit on the occasional uh, cheater just to reinforce that among students who want to benefit. Um, so I wanted to share that. Absolutely. Thank you, Alexis. Um, I'm going to wind us up here. I just want to let everyone in the audience and our panelists know that I did put together, for those of you that sent me some um, information earlier, I did put together kind of a resource sheet that I'm going to send out to those who registered for the webinar. 
Um, Alexis, you mentioned a couple articles today. If any of you have any other resources you'd like to share, I can add those to the sheet um, when I send it out. So please feel free to email those to me. We did have a recording done today, so we will also publish that recording on our Minnesota Learning Commons YouTube channel. And I want to thank our panelists so much um, for being willing to step up and answer some of these tough questions and share your experiences. So if we could give them a huge virtual round of applause, that would be great. Um, and I think this is definitely a topic we'll be coming back to um, probably again and again in the months Thanks. to come. Mary, one quick question. Um, will the Q&A answers be part of the recording? We will figure out, Stephen and I mm -hmm. will figure out how to capture those. And okay. yep, yep. Yes. Okay, Stephen, do you have anything to say that you'd like to say in closing? Just thanks so much to you, Mary, for your facilitation today and for all the great contributions from our panelists. Thank you, Stephen. Well, with that, we will um, sign off for now and um, be in touch soon. Thanks so much. Thank you.